So welcome. Can everybody hear me also in the back rows? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I work for Deutsche Telekom. I'm from Germany. And um, as you can see already on everything, um, which is uh, uh, Telekom is always in this magenta color. So please bear with me so you will see a lot of uh, magenta color uh, during this presentation. Um, since we run the Open Telecom Cloud um, in Europe, in, in Germany, and we have uh, also um, data centers in other countries as well, um, but we are actually one of the um, largest open source, open stack based public clouds in Europe. Um, so if you really need something um, that is uh, based on open source software, then this might be a good choice. But I'm not here to advertise Open Telecom Cloud here. Um, my name is uh, Niels Magnus and um, I'm working as a senior architect for the Open Telecom Cloud at T Systems International. Um, there is a um, company behind that. And uh, next to this role, I have also a second uh, role that is uh, reaching out to technical communities. Technical communities like you are one. Um, um, I work in the uh, ecosystem squad, and I'm a product owner there. So what we are doing is um, providing information as well as tools for our customers. What this means, I will explain in a second. So I had several other positions in consulting and engineering um, of IT. I was working um, a couple of years as a journalist, as an editor, um, and an author for uh, tech magazines, for maybe uh, you know, of a Linux magazine. Um, I'm a long time um, user and advocate of uh, open source software itself. Um, I'm a founder and host for many European conferences and events like uh, that, and I'm also a member of the German chapter of the Unix user school, so G U U G. Uh, so that's me, that's my team, or at least part of my team, uh, the ecosystem squad. The ecosystem squad, uh, we have a kind of a, a motto, uh, we want uh, to make our users happy, and by two means uh, we try to do that. Uh, first is to provide them the right tools, uh, and the other one is provide them the right information they need. So uh, tools that they might need um, are things like the OpenStack SDK, the OpenStack uh, command line client, um, uh, Ansible bindings, Terraform bindings, etc., etc. All such stuff um, is uh, my team developing, and we provide them also for download on our website, etc. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned already, um, we have also information to provide, information about our services. As you know, uh, an open stack uh, based um, cloud uh, comprises of many different uh, services, and at the moment, we have about 80 uh, different services in the Open Telecom Cloud and counting. And each of, them, each of the service comes with some documentation explaining how to use it, um, how to program for it, uh, how to uh, make software for, for it, etc. pp. And when we do all this, we try to automate stuff as much as possible. That is. Uh, very important for us because of the sheer size of the documents and the sheer size of uh, uh, the different services. So um, we cannot uh, easily update manually uh, some uh, documentation because we would simply um, 
lose track of uh, what we have we done already and what not. Um, I've prepared here a short journey comprised of uh, uh, five steps. So the first is already over, so some, some context and uh, objectives. Why do we need uh, uh, documentation or why do we have uh, do documentation from our perspective here? And then I have a, a chapter um, where we look a little bit in the challenges that we faced when we started our project with, um, that I'm uh, uh, displaying here. And once we have uh, discussed a little bit the well, dip of depressions and the challenges, then we look a little bit into the actual transformation. What did we change? What did we set up um, to overcome those uh, challenges? Finally, we look a little bit about the result, um, the solution and the resolution, what worked well, and a very short wrap-up and some future ideas. Maybe you want to contribute also something. Um, if so, please don't. Uh, hesitate um, to raise your hand, and I think I have a my, ah, we have a microphone there. So, in case, uh, by the way, if you have uh, any questions during my presentation, feel free to ask me. As long as as it's a short question, otherwise, if it's a, a longer discussion, then let's postpone that uh, for the time uh, after the presentation. All right. Good. So documentation from chaos to clarity is a little bit uh, an alternative um, a headline for um, about well almost three years a long uh, journey that we now uh, have taken and um, <coughs> we have lots of documentation as I explained already for different um, stakeholders for the engineers. Uh, um, when they do the delivery, so they want to uh, look up what is the specification of the service, how does the API work, etc. Um, the same um, uh, for the operations uh, guys and the, the QA colleagues um, of mine. So they um, have to maintain the services, um, maybe adding new flavors or adding new disk types or adding new services themselves. Um, so uh, they need to look up a lot of uh, information. And also our audit and uh, compliance uh, department um, is very much uh, interested in documentation because that's their base of uh, all the specifications and validations and evalu evaluations <coughs> and so on. And last but not least, why are we doing all this? There are our customers and they also want uh, to understand how does our public cloud work. But actually, it not always looks uh, as uh, neat and pretty like this, uh, but often it's uh, something like this. And uh, we have a lot of objectives, um, or we found a lot of objectives for how to access information, where to find it, how to um, search for this, how accurate is uh, our documentation, um, is it actually the, the last uh, version or are there any um, pending uh, changes already? Um, what is about um, why we are updating um, documentation? If we have uh, two different teams and each team is um, working on one part of the documentation, how do we avoid conflicts or something like that? Can several editors work in parallel? And um, how reliable is that? So we have an extra team uh, of experts who um, cross-check our documentation uh, <coughs> for clarity and for consistency. And um, it's important also for us uh, to understand this document was already reviewed uh, and uh, we can rely on that. 
So with those objectives in mind, I uh, made up some virtual colleagues here. Uh, well, uh, thanks to Gen AI, I also uh, created uh, some pictures of them. Uh, welcome with me, mm. uh, um, Tom, to the left-hand side. Um, he's, a, he's 43 years old, he has two kids, and he's a senior project manager and worked already in, uh, also in the past role uh, as an editor, as a tech uh, editor. And um, together with uh, Tim, he's 28, he's single and just finished his bachelor's um, degree from university and he's a Python 3 fan and also recently discovered Gen AI. Um, and the two of them face a number of issues. And let us now um, uh, uh, walk alongside uh, to them and uh, look a little bit more in detail to their issues that they face. So the first thing, there was obviously um, already, uh, before we started our project, some documentation. But how was it set up, this documentation? It was actually a number um, of long and thick um, Word documents. Word documents with all the documentation described in them. Um, and those Word documents have been linked on a, um, on a um, web server, on a static uh, web server, so that um, customers or users could just download those files and browse through it. A little bit later, um, we also converted this in a very basic um, a Word export to web um, format so that you could at least click directly in the, in the browser. But effectively, it was no more than exactly that. Just Word documents. Um, listed in a, uh, in a long list of, um, uh, on a web server. Um, to describe a little bit the, the, the size uh, of this issue is um, that we are currently serving 25,000 uh, documents. Take it or leave it, it depends a little bit on how you count that. Um, and they are all on different OpenStack services and tools, um, and well, later on I have a screenshot of a, of a, a table of contents so that you can get a rough impression um, about that. So that's what the two of them, our uh, small uh, task force, um, started with. And um, let's see what uh, what kind of challenges that we uh, actually fa faced. Um, the first issue was it was very slow. It was very slow. As I said, there have been uh, Word documents. <coughs> and if, uh, for example, um, uh, Tom discovered there was a missing comma or there was just a, a single typo in, in, a, uh, in a word, he had to write an email to the maintaining um, um, engineer who was um, responsible for this document. Then they had their own processes uh, how to fix that or they did not have the time and we did not know what was happening. Are they working on that or are they or, or don't they uh, find the time at the moment, etc. pp. So that was very, very um, confusing and also very time consuming, uh, obviously. There was a lot of poor communication uh, because uh, each team had their own pace um, and uh, not all of them have, had been um, uh, real technical writers. And Effectively, it uh, resulted in copying over um, megabytes and megabytes um, of huge uh, Word documents. You uh, probably know that they tend to become larger and larger. 
just to fix the single single keystroke uh, typo or something like that. Um, and as well, um, the actual deployment, if you say so, on the website, on this static website that I um, mentioned, was also very tedious. You had to bundle something and zip something in this directory and zip something in that directory and copy it over. And uh, yeah, it was a, a huge number of manual steps. And um, that was the first identify challenge. Um, the second, even uh, more severe uh, issue was the inconsistent state. Um, the state was um, um, inconsistent because nobody knew exactly who is currently in charge of the documentation of this uh, uh, specific documentation of the, say, NOVA service. Um, uh, did I have uh, applied some changes and um, uh, placed it back to the web server, or did I place it directly to one other colleague so that he could add his own changes on that, or um, are there are two uh, teams working in parallel, so there's a lot of um, uh, problems involved with that, and um, that result in this inconsistent state. So the big question is, uh, where is the actual source of truth? Can we rely on some place, or uh, can we rely on some specific versions of a document to be the most accurate one? That's the second one. Um, the third one was uh, the tedious manual tasks. Um, uh, that was because of the technology that was used. So, uh, for example, to um, make some markup uh, for the documentation. So, for example, if you uh, place a file name in the documentation, um, uh, we used at that time just normal word um, format templates. You know, you can apply uh, different uh, templates uh, to paragraphs or to single characters. And all that had to be done manually. Um, and well, this is working with a mouse all the time for stuff like this, um, for um, uh, documents which are easily 500 pages long, is also very tedious. And the same applies to creating table of contents and uh, refresh a table of tables and export it and to ship it, etc. So these steps had to be performed manually one by one. And if you made uh, one uh, mistake, then you have to start over again. And finally, there was also uh, uh, discovered that we lacked some features that we liked to have. Uh, so for example, we want to have a nice looking um, code highlighting uh, um, uh, component uh, for our example codes for uh, the OpenStack SDK, for example. And something else, uh, I told you uh, already about um, our uh, corporate color, uh, this uh, magenta. Um, well, uh, the magenta uh, stayed now for us uh, for over 25 years. But for example, the fonts uh, um, now and then slightly change. At least um, um, our brand uh, and marketing colleagues insist always on that, to have always uh, the, the, the latest um, fonts and um, uh, stuff on uh, the website. And that was also um, uh, difficult uh, to achieve. Um, especially we had no separations of uh, content and markup, and we will talk about that uh, in, a, in a second again. So let's just note uh, that was our challenge number four. It was a little bit outdated. Not all features that we wished for had been implemented. So now let's see how we actually um, <coughs> um, uh, solved those issues. And um, 
let uh, to skip a little bit uh, faster over this here. Um, I leave the slides uh, in the slide deck here so that uh, if you want to download this uh, later on, you can uh, read for the uh, more detailed stuff. Um, but the main idea, number one, was uh, to adapt something that we are pretty much uh, um, uh, aware of already, and that is um, working in an agile style and using something like GitOps. GitOps, um, uh, or uh, Git in, in general, so checking stuff into repositories to version it and to have some machinery behind that, some um, continuous integration that is capable of um, doing something as soon as um, some code changes um, uh, arrive at the repository. And I try to sketch this here a little bit. Uh, let's start here uh, uh, on the top. Um, one of the uh, tech writers or the developers or whoever that might be pushes uh, some changes to a repository, just a Git repository. So no special access right to special servers are necessary whatsoever. Just do this um, push uh, to the repository, commit your changes and uh, push uh, those changes to the repository itself. Then uh, our uh, continu continuous integration server, Zool, which is also um, a project um, based uh, here in the Open Infra Foundation, um, and we use that uh, all the time to monitor our repositories and um, to see uh, if something has changed, then the whole process is uh, started. Um, in order to be able to, to run, uh, to, to build uh, this documentation code, um, we need some infrastructure, and this infrastructure is uh, provided by our cloud itself. That's why we have here also the stage of the open um, stack infrastructure in between. And once we have prepared everything, um, including an extensive uh, test suite, and we are checking for consistency, uh, for spelling, uh, for, um, for broken links, for example, etc., etc., then um, we can actually uh, run and um, convert um, the source code um, uh, into, say, some HTML um, output and to render that. Actually, it's not only HTML, but we are uh, creating also um, uh, PDF files. So, in theory, we could even create full ebooks or whatsoever, because that's more or less just a, a new driver in our um, tool that we're using here that is Sphinx. And Sphinx is a tool that uh, does the actual conversion from um, uh, the source format to the target. Uh, so this is the kind of flow, and uh, um, uh, the second idea um, uh, that we tried to um, uh, implement here is the Unix principle. So um, here to the right, uh, this is uh, Doug McIlroy, so you may have heard of uh, Ken Thompson and um, um, uh, his other uh, colleagues are writing um, uh, Unix in the early 1970s, and um, Doug uh, McIlroy was there, I think, their team lead or something like that. Um, and um, so he invented some of those ideas, and the other guys implemented it. So what we are doing is uh, we are taking small tools and combining them. So Sphinx is not so complex. It's complex enough, indeed. Um, but uh, it's a small tool with a single purpose, getting um, some uh, um, uh, restructured text as input and creating, for example, some HTML or some PDF or some other formats as well. Um, we talked about Azul already, we talked already about OpenStack, and we talked about Git. 
And that means we just needed a little bit of glue code to put everything together. And this is how our solution design effectively looks like. So this is just another view of um, the diagram that I um, already uh, uh, showed to you. So uh, also here we start uh, on the very top. Um, we, uh, doing, we are doing some editing of some markdown code. We check this into the repositories. The repositories <coughs> um, can then, then um, be uh, reviewed by our QA colleagues. This is a cycle um, until um, everyone is uh, satisfied with that. After that, um, the CI system itself uh, does a lot of um, sanity checks and it needs to be approved and uh, forwarded to the next uh, step and then it is rendered there, pushed on a web server. Uh, there is a search index, index uh, created and lots of other um, smaller steps as well. So as you can see, Every single step here is automated. That is uh, the important part of it. Um, a third idea is um, a semantic, but not visual, markup. Um, so you may have seen uh, this guy over there. This is Donald Knuth, a very uh, famous American uh, computer scientist. He wrote uh, a series of uh, very famous books, and I think he's still working on, on the series. Um, uh, it's called The Art of uh, Computer Programming. And he started in the early 1970s, or maybe even he started already in the 1960s, on uh, this uh, book, uh, this series of books. And at one point, oh, I'm sorry, um, he wasn't um, satisfied uh, with the uh, type of um, uh, text processing he had available. And then he invented uh, Tech, uh, the typeset system. And that was a very good example of um, separation of uh, the semantics, the meaning uh, of his code, um, and the actual uh, formatting. Um, yeah, and uh, as you probably know, there are several of uh, those uh, concepts not only in, in LaTeX, but also, uh, for example, in HTML or in Markdown, you see something very similar. You try to focus on the content and not on the formatting. Let the computer do the formatting itself. Um, uh, in theory, you can turn this uh, further and further so that you, are, um, you could start uh, just using YAML um, as a uh, formatting language as we are all uh, nowadays using YAML as a configuration language for example for Kubernetes. Um, I'm not sure if it really makes sense to go as far like, uh, as of that, um, but it would be possible. What we're actually using is restructured text that is pretty similar to a uh, normal markdown, but it has some extra features and it's um, uh, pretty popular in the OpenStack um, environment in the ecosystem, and that's why we use that. And Sphinx has a driver for this um, uh, already. Um, yeah, there are some other tools. Um, let me just skip over this. Here you just see an example. Uh, on the left hand side, this is the uh, restructured text. Uh, you see, this is just more or less uh, plain text with some slight formatting. And on the right hand side, you see the result of that. Uh, the last idea is um, uh, a non-technical um, approach, and that is uh, to distribute uh, the workload. And distributing the workload means that we are no longer, as um, the ecosystem team, uh, responsible for all the documentation, but the teams themselves are responsible for that. And uh, that helped us a lot. But for that, we had to enable that. So that was um, the overview. And I just made a, a few uh, screenshots here so that you can see what is, is the actual result, what we call the help center. It's the help center uh, of all the 
different services you see here in the main boxes. Um, the list goes on uh, to the bottom uh, to right here. And uh, we have also some some navigation in there. Uh, and from the detail pages, it looks like this. So it's not just that we are processing text. There's also tables and source code, and um, uh, there are uh, images and so on. And one of the cool features is um, if you, as a as a user, as a um, customer of us, um, discover some bugs. Uh, you can directly um, on the um, top right hand side um, uh, click on that and uh, edit this page directly. Uh, then it uh, will just create a uh, GitHub issue for that. That was my presentation. Let me summarize. We had uh, uh, these I identified three uh, key features. One is um, the idea of GitOps. Um, have a single source of proof and focus on the content, so content over the tools. Um, here's the summary uh, also um, in, the, in the smaller steps. Uh, let's keep this as takeaways. And with that said, I skip my, my extra ideas uh, we have for the future. Um, and uh, I would like to thank you very much.